On behalf of the Pacific Ambassadors and permanent representatives of the Washington and, and New York areas, we welcome all of you to Pacific Day 2014. Pacific Day, as those of you that know, it's been around for a long time, but it's uh, normally hosted by the Washington Pacific Committee, which consists of the embassies and offices of Pacific Island countries, states, territories represented in Washington and New York. My name is Murray Hebert. I work on, on uh, the Pacific Partners Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. And we're uh, co-sponsoring this, um, this event, and uh, we try to have uh, events and writings that try to raise awareness and stimulate discussion on the Pacific Island issues in Washington. This year, we're very lucky, thanks to uh, uh, f uh, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry, that uh, he had hosted an Oceans Conference here the last two days. As a result, we have a number of leaders, ministers, and experts from the Pacific here with us. The uh, importance of the Pacific is obviously known to everybody in the Pacific Island countries for whom the ocean is both fundamental for their economies, cultures, and their environment. We're going to begin this uh, seminar this afternoon by, uh, with a few short speeches by some of the leaders that are visiting from the region. The first speaker will be the Honorable Tony De Broom, who is the Foreign Minister of the Republic of the Marshall Islands. He's the current chair of the Pacific Island Forum, the PIF. Before taking on his role earlier this year as foreign minister, he had a distinguished role in various other uh, government posts, uh, various other government posts back home. Thank you. Please, foreign minister. Uh, Your Excellency, Mr. President, Tamir Mengsao, colleague ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I see many friends here that I haven't seen for many years. I'm delighted to be back in Washington. Normally, I would take what has been prepared for me to recite and say whatever I please. However, I am being disciplined because I've been told I speak for the forum and our president is the chairman. I'm merely his minister. Uh, as the current chair of the Pacific Island Forum, uh, which we will soon pass to my good friend, the president of Palau in July. But on behalf of uh, President Christopher Loyak and the people of the Marshall Islands, I bring you warm Yahweh and welcome to Pacific Day. I'm honored to be here in DC in the company of so many brothers and sisters of the Pacific and so many friends from times gone by. Our islands had the honor and pleasure not only to welcome many of you to the forum last September, but also to serve as forum chair during an intense year of regional activity. We have already started working with Palau as incoming chair and look forward to a gathering next month, which as the very first forum communique, communique stated, is among neighbors and friends. Together, we will have important work to do in preparation for the Global Summit of Small Island Developing States in September, which will be hosted by our good friends in Samoa. But it is well past the hour when the international community can do a better job responding to the unique characteristics of small island states. The summit's theme of genuine and durable partnerships is a key opportunity to bring forward our own Pacific ambitions for a sustainable future balancing growth and respect for the environment. The recent meeting, or this meeting that just concluded yesterday, are still actually it's still going, on oceans that our good friend, Secretary John Kerry called here in DC, emphasizes the pivotal role 
island nations must play in advancing global action on fisheries and oceans. We are truly thrilled that Palau has chosen a theme on oceans for this year's forum, which ensures that we can raise the Pacific voice to help spur stronger political will around the world. Pacific leaders can stand as true stewards of one of the world's most important, but often neglected, resources. Together with our partners, we can tell the true story of sustainable development, that profit and conservation can, in fact, coexist. This is why forum members have pushed so hard for a dedicated global goal of oceans in the United Nations post-2015 Sustainable Development Agenda. The Pacific Forum has a unique legacy. As small islands and partners, we bridge the gap between large and small, rich and poor, united together in a common Pacific spirit and regional identity. As Forum Islands, we have accounted for successes and some shortcomings in meeting the UN's Millennium Development Goals. But this year, the forum stands at the edge of challenging decisions. In reviewing the Pacific Plan, leaders considered not only Pacific alignment, a policy alignment and administrative reforms, but also the core issue of our Pacific regional identity. Looking forward, we hope and expect that the forum will foster and the emerging political voice of all Pacific small island nations and also strengthen a truly mutual engagement with our closest metropolitan members, Australia and New Zealand, as well as our fast growing list of post-forum dialogue partners. Last September in Majuro, forum leaders adopted the Majuro Declaration for Climate Leadership. This declaration sets to the world a framework in which all of us, small and large, end the finger pointing and take the strongest possible action together to confront the impacts of climate change. As the Pacific, we can stand together as one in confronting our regions and our world's most important long-term security challenge. These are impacts we see now, and they will only become more intense in the years and decades to come. But on one thing, there is no disagreement. On one thing, we are fully united. And that is that we will leave this world and the blue ocean a better place than we, than we found it. For our children, for our grandchildren, for all future generations to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister De Bruyne. Uh, as our next speaker, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, the Honorable Tony Raymond Gesso, Gesso, who is the President of the Republic of Palau, which is the host of the 2014 uh, PIF Forum. Prior to his current post, he had various other positions, including the, serving as vice president, minister of the administration, and he had a key role in Palau's uh, transition to independence. President Ramagasu, please. Will Swelba. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, it's, uh, it's always good to be among the company of uh, fellow brothers and sisters of the Pacific, and certainly among friends uh, and fellow children of the ocean. Before I say a few remarks, I do want to begin by thanking Ambassador Mike Moore and the government and people of uh, New Zealand for kindly hosting this uh, Pacific event. And I do understand that over the years, uh, 
this event has uh, become a, an expected event to really showcase the, the, the diversities of the Pacific and the unity of these uh, diversities. So can we give a big hand to the ambassador and the people of New Zealand? Thank you. <laughs> Folks, this has been a, a tremendous good week, and I would say a very successful week for the agenda of the Pacific. The fact that the United States hosted a conference on the ocean has really highlighted and showcased the very important issues for all of us out there in the Pacific. And I think with the U.S. Uh, role and leadership, uh, we can only expect good things to come out of the whole issue on the ocean. Lest we forget, the Millennium Development Goals are coming up for negotiations. And so it is important that we as Pacific Islanders uh, focus and support the notion to have the ocean as an a standalone agenda when it comes to the floor of the United Nations uh, later on. The, having the ocean as a standalone agenda can only help to focus on the effects of climate change, global warming, sea, sea ocean acidification, pollution, um, overfishing, uh, you name it, all the issues that are out there for our very survival in essence as a people and as island nations, all of this can be focused around the ocean. And so I think it's important uh, that the United States is leading the, the, uh, the mission, and uh, I do want to recognize uh, uh, this, uh, the contributions that have been made this week. If you read the newspapers and follow the news developments, all those commitments that have been made this week and including the initiatives made by the Obama administration are really going to trigger a global response that can only be a good thing collectively for all of us. And so as Pacific Island uh, children, um, I think we need to also be unified in emphasizing a very important point, and that is uh, we are no longer talking about the threat of, or the facing the threat of the, the myriad of problems facing the ocean. We are already living it. Uh, so th there's a big difference uh, upon people still waiting for the, the impact of all of these uh, myriads of problems to happen. Uh, we are in fact living the dangers of what everybody is talking about. Then there's the other point that I know even our partners and development partners, uh, everyone wants to be, you know, wants to be a, a partner. But the big question for us as islanders is, what are we doing for ourselves? What do we bring to the table? And uh, I think this is where the issue of uh, marine protected areas is a very concrete contributions that island nations can bring to the table. You know, we have to do what is within our power to also address the issues and the uh, address the solutions and address the mitigation and the adaptations that are necessary to be out there. So the the uh, the marine the Palau Marine Sanctuary is uh, only a part of the marine protected area initiative that many of the Pacific Island countries are doing, whether it's Cook Island, Kiribati, Federated States of Micronesia, Republic of the Marshall Islands, uh, Palau, um, uh, I mentioned Cook Islands, and many other uh, uh, nations out there in the Pacific. We're all doing our share of uh, really protecting our oceans and, and uh, reefs. And as I mentioned the other day, uh, folks, we are not advocating a one-size-fits-all uh, formula. I think all, all of us can collectively bring to the table what we're able to do in terms of these marine protected areas. Um, for Palau, we are proposing our entire 200-mile uh, exclusive economic zone 
uh, while reserving a small portion of that for our domestic uh, food security and, and also our economic uh, uh, endeavors. But we know that we can do a big contribution to not only Palau but to the region as far as the regional effort to also protect and preserve our oceans. Um, people may ask why uh, this is such a uh, um, what do you call it? an ambitious thing to do, but uh, I would just like to remind that the, the Micronesia region actually has already started years ago the first challenge of what we call the Micronesia challenge, and that started by preserving at least 30 percent of the marine environment and 20 percent of the forest. So many of the the, re, uh, the island the governments in the region, which is the Marshall Islands, the Federated States of Micronesia, Palau, Saipan, and Guam, are already, already committed to protecting 30% of their marine environment. So having a bigger sanctuary is a natural progression from what has already been a successful endeavor. And the Micronesian Trust uh, has also been established and it has to be proven to be a very successful partnership because we are matching the contributions of our partners and the money that comes into the fund is helping the protected area networks that are spread out throughout Micronesia. For Palau itself, we have a green fee of $50 and people pay that knowing that it doesn't go to the government coffers, it goes to a very special program on the protection of the environment. We are picking up from the, the success and declaration of the Marshall Islands uh, Declaration, marshalling the response to climate change. We're going to further focus uh, on the issues, uh, which actually has been the, the um, not the same issue, but the, the important issue year after year regarding the oceans. Uh, and we will continue to do that until we have a collective effort internationally in combating climate change, global warming, and all the dangers confronting the ocean. Um, finally, um, let me just say that one of the initiatives that I want to ask of us as children of the Pacific is that it would be a really good thing and within our own power to do so, to declare the whole Pacific region as a shark sanctuary. Um, many of us, many of the, of the governments in the region have already done that. And uh, I know that a, a, a live shark is worth millions more than a dead shark. And so finally, folks, I, I do want to use this opportunity and say that oftentimes we as, we as islanders tend to say we inherited the environment from our ancestors. But I think in this day and age, we need to look forward and say, we are simply borrowing the environment from our future children. I thank you so. So while we're getting mic'd up here, uh, I just want to mention we're going to open it now, uh, up, open up the floor for a few minutes for questions uh, from the ingoing, uh, the outgoing and incoming PIF chairs. So if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, I'll identify you, and then we'll uh, there'll be some mic runners that will will um, uh, give you a mic, and then please identify yourself by name and organization, and then. We'll have the two uh, speakers uh, answer your questions. Thank you.
Okay, I think we, are we working now? Is it working? Hello, hello. I think so. Yeah. Okay, uh, do we have questions for our two, uh, two speakers? Boy, we're very shy. <laughs> so could, could I ask you maybe, for both of you participated in the conference, the, the our, our, our Oceans Conference, in terms of the PIF uh, going forward, do you see some very specific ideas uh, initiatives that were proposed that you think you can use in the PIF going forward? Question for either one of you, mm. or both. Yes. Hello. Okay. At, oh, okay. Well, as I said, the one of the, the biggest thing that we can take going to the, uh, to the forum, perhaps, is the knowing that uh, this is no longer a secluded issue for us, that we can begin to discuss partnerships as we go to the, to the forum. There were a lot of initiatives, uh, specifically the port, uh, uh, the, uh, the initiative on uh, pirate products, uh, that I think can also go a long way to support uh, IUU activities uh, in, you know, around, the, uh, around the region. Uh, there was also the um, initiative uh, regarding enforcement, uh, the initiatives on, um, on uh, research. Uh, all of these that were uh, kind of announced uh, uh, at the Ocean Forum can only be a good guidelines uh, to take uh, to the forum. But as I mentioned, the, the main objective uh, we believe is that we come out of the forum with a united uh, effort, a specific islanders, uh, to have a clear cut uh, policy on the importance of the ocean, uh, leading to the small island development uh, uh, states a conference in Samoa later on in September. Uh, and then after that, it's on to the United Nations uh, with the Pacific Agenda. Foreign Minister, you have some questions? There's a question. Yes, please. Don't. Thanks, uh, David Shepard, Director General of SPREP, the Regional Environment uh, Program in the Pacific. President, to a question to President of Palau, if you could uh, comment on some of the economic benefits through tourism mm -hmm. associated with the declaration of the MPA and also the Rock Island World Heritage Site. President, uh, and a question to uh, Minister De Bruum, uh, we have a number of uh, big events coming up in our region, the Forum, then the SIDS event, then the SPREP uh, Minister's Meeting in late September. How can we most strategically take advantage of this as a region for our benefit, including to move forward uh, most effectively on these fantastic uh, commitments from the Oceans Conference this week? Thank you. Oh. Well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say a few uh, things on, on, on that. Um, you know, one of the points that was mentioned uh, the other day that can only fit the Pacific Islands is that we need to move towards uh, science and what uh, the facts tell us through scientific research and studies. I think too often we have been focused on the economic uh, negotiations. Uh, and so the conference uh, uh, focus on, uh, on those things can only be a good thing for all of us. And then the, one of the, uh, the important uh, complementary issue that was raised up, of course, is the issues on the high seas, what happens over there beyond the territorial uh, integrities of the islands. If we could resolve that with uh, uh, 
uh, the leadership of uh, nations like the United States, uh, then we can certainly not only maximize our economic uh, uh, values, but also the sustainable uh, programs that we're all trying to, to do out there in the islands. So I, I foresee uh, the coming uh, uh, meetings of Pacific Islanders, whether it's SEEDS or SPREP or the UN, uh, our issues are definitely highlighted. And uh, I mentioned briefly the enforcement. Uh, that can, will go a long way uh, just by having the United States come on board because we don't have the resources, uh, fr quite frankly, to protect our MPAs. But uh, with the technologies that's out there, we don't have to invent, to reinvent the uh, uh, technology. It's a, it's a matter of uh, sharing and partnering and sharing the resources to help make it a sustainable and ocean for all of us. meeting in Samoa, as well as the SPEP meeting in Metro later this year. Uh, I think our opportunities that are lining up towards the, the, the Secretary General Summit, as well as the upcoming meetings in, in Paris leading to the climate change agreement, that we all should take advantage of. The, the, the countries of the, the country members of PIF and their partners, I think, uh, are, a, are a very a, are a formidable force in, in, in pushing ahead ideas of conservation and, and climate change in the Pacific. But not only in the Pacific. In recent uh, times, the United States has been kind to invite uh, us to participate in some of the meetings that they host, that they have not. Uh, had participation from small island countries before, such as the, the uh, major economic forum meeting, MEF, uh, which we are also invited to participate uh, later this year. But I think the, the, the most important uh, contribution, as the President has pointed out earlier, is that the small island countries of the Pacific are not playing the perennial role of the Pacific native sitting under the coconut tree waiting for the coconut to fall. We are actually taking a leadership position in climate change. We're sounding out and we're, 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 we're putting the issue to the table where it counts. And the calling of this meeting by Secretary Kerry and the United States hosting this meeting the last two days is, I think, a culmination of that effort. I think it, it shows and it demonstrates to the world that yes, the United States is going to step in now. Not only did uh, uh, Secretary, Gen uh, Secretary Kerry come to bat at this meeting. He brought in uh, President Obama to say a few words of encouragement. And then to top it all off, he brought in Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> <laughs> and when Hollywood gets involved, you can see movement. And I think this all was part of the beauty of this meeting. It, it, it combined uh, the efforts of states of organizations, of NGOs, of young people, of young people who stayed throughout all the sessions of this, session, of this meeting and participated fully. I, I think the completeness of that is a demonstration that we have in fact scored. Our voices have now been heard. We can move forward together to resolve some of our most critical issues. There are other questions in the back? Many, many thanks. Uh, Angus Friday, Grenada's ambassador to the United States, formerly Ocean's representative at the World Bank, and formerly uh, ambassador of Grenada to the UN, where I had the honor and privilege to chair the Alliance of Small Island States. Mr. DeBroom, we've had a number of exchanges now, and my question is about how we might be able to use the upcoming SIDS conference in Samoa for two purposes. And that is the idea of bringing together the green and the blue economy, and also the idea of promoting this thing that's being talked about, where we no longer refer to ourselves as small island developing states, but ocean states, or great ocean states, or if you will, 
Great Ocean Developing States, GODS. I'll let you work it out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Minister Broom, you've been a pioneer and you've been a champion for OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. And for many institutions, this is still seen as an R&D project. But if we can make it happen, this is going to be something which can transform energy, not just for islands, but can help to transform the very issues that we're dealing with with climate change. And so my question is, how can we do two things? How can we use the SIDS International Conference in Samoa to promote and to really catalyze and catapult the idea of uh, ocean thermal energy conversion, recognizing that it still needs a lot of work, but we will be the ones as islands to benefit? And how can we further promote this idea of ocean states and get more funding, et cetera, uh, to the very cause that, uh, that we all associate with? Thank you. I thank my good friend, Ambassador Friday. Um, we have, in, in spite of discouragement along the way, that this technology is still in the R&D stage, promoted the idea that it is, in fact, ready for prime time. We are talking here about a technology that can transform the four of the most vulnerable states in the world, Tuvalu, Kiribati, Marshall's uh, Outer Island FSM, perhaps even the Maldives, into self-sufficiency in energy and water. Biggest problem with small island countries is trying to derive value from their most uh, uh, important resources of fisheries and tourism is that we have energy that is unaffordable and a lack of water. For the most part, most of our countries do not have access to those building blocks of our economies. But as Ambassador Friday says, OTEC provides an answer to those basic building blocks. It will allow us, for example, Maduro exports to China on an annual basis close to $1.8 billion worth of raw fish. Of course, it's not all Marshallese fish, but it's fish collected from the PNA and the neighboring countries. Trans, uh, transshipped out of the major report. The value derived from that export for the Marshall Islands is based barely more than 10 or 12 million dollars a year. If we could add value to that, we can have countries that were all, always classified as uh, uh, economic basket cases to be net exporters of energy within the decade. We do not need large amounts of money to be invested in this, in this, in this, in, in this new technology because it, is, uh, it does require some capital, capital intensive investment. However, in the case of the Marshalls, we have been working with the United States Department of Defense to allow for a power purchase agreement which would allow Quadrant to purchase from us power generated by the OTEC the plant that we expect to build soon. That would allow for private public investment in such a plant. It would then allow this technology to be translated to other areas of the Pacific, especially the close neighbor neighbors of Kiribati, Tuvalu, and my choice in Micronesia, Chuk. I think that uh, we have all the ingredients together. We have all the necessary technological groups together. We have the builders together. And it will be just a matter of getting a good memorandum of understanding with the US Department of Army before we move forward on this. We also want to share this on an extensive basic, uh, basis with SIDS. The reason that it, had, it, it is necessary for us to step back and do it on a private basis before we move it into the SIDS arena is that SIDS had the opportunity to fund the first feasibility study for this technology in the Pacific. All the SIDS country members endorsed the Marshalls as the primary candidate for the technology. However, when the money came filtering down the various layers of bureaucracy, including World Bank, it ended up with this decision 
we think that there should be a pre-pre-visibility study done <laughs> on this. So it's, it's, it, I think that's an example of the kind of problems that the small island countries have marrying up resources with need. And we should also stop thinking of producing feasibility studies that apply on, on a world scale for projects that should be dedicated to resolving immediate problems of climate change that translate into the larger picture of eliminating problems with global warming and pollution of the earth. I think we have, a, we have that in this technology and we will continue to pursue it with vigor. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, Foreign Minister De Bruyne and uh, uh, President Remen Gesso, thank you very much All right. uh, for, uh, for your insights. Appreciate it. So our next, next speaker is uh, the Honorable Lauren Robert, who is the Foreign Minister of the Federated States of Micronesia, who will outline some of the key priorities of his country. He, he, prior to becoming Foreign Minister, uh, Mr. the Honorable Mr. Robert uh, served in various roles with, within, the, um, within his country, but also within the United Nations, ADB, World Bank, and also was involved in various nuclear and, and fisheries agreements, ne agreement negotiations. Uh, Foreign Minister Robert, please. Thank you. Thank you, Master of Ceremony, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, fellow Pacific Islanders, friends of the Pacific, at the outset, allow me to pay my personal respect, courtesies, and compliments to all of you, and of course, including our good friends from the United States, to officials and dignitaries, dignitaries who are with us this afternoon. I elitentiro mefairo miifidiunus and menden mesufen on on any medicine. It is my great pleasure and honor to speak before you in this important seminar, and I am most grateful for the invitation extended to me to participate in it. As mentioned earlier, today is Pacific Day, and it is exceptionally well-timed this year, taking place following immediately the International Conference on Our Ocean that was convened by Secretary Kerry over the last two days, to which I reiterate President Mori and the entire leadership of the FSM, our appreciation and gratitude to Secretary Kerry for his leadership and vision in organizing a very, very successful conference, one of its kind. My little daughter will say it's awesome. The current international focus on the health of the ocean is very much welcome and encouraging to Pacific Islanders and I also commend the organizers of this seminar for maintaining the momentum of success of the conference and for giving us another forum today to further amplify the importance of our ocean as it relates to our Pacific situation. The ongoing global discussion on oceans have exemplifies the spirit of constructive collaboration and partnership that is the very heart of our Pacific way. Wherever the welfare of our people is at stake, especially our children, the children of our children and future generations, the Pacific way must continue to be our guide. Ladies and gentlemen, the entire human race is a beneficiary of the ocean, and we must make every effort to bring into sharp focus the special case 
of our island peoples. Our way of life is very much bound to the health of the ocean and proper management of its resources. For many of our islands in the Pacific, the income generated from the tuna industry is our single most largest and important source of income. In the Pacific, that we are known as Rematau, it's a Chukis word, meaning that we are peoples of the sea. Our Rematau as people of the sea has deep meaning and enduring implications. Our very existence is defined by our ocean, which imposes upon us a special sacred duty to love and to respect the sea and to continue to be responsible stewards of the ocean. Our world is the ocean itself for the very, very simple reason that the seas bring us together. They do not separate us. Our islands sustain us. Our island nation enlarges us and make us stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, these are not my words. They are from the preamble of the FSM National Constitution. Across the oceans of the world, we are informed by scientists and experts that our resources are facing depletion and contamination. And in a cruel twist of fate, the ocean is now an antagonist of our small Pacific islands where sea level rise, where water temperatures increase, where coastline erode, and where storm surges become more intense. Sadly, overfishing, illegal harvesting, acidification are seriously threatening the bounties of the sea where we have to come to rely on for sustenance at our villages. The pelagic species of the entire Pacific region face similar dire situation. Furthermore, Increasing climate warming may in fact alter our normal mitigation patterns of such species to the detriment of our Pacific region. It is therefore we in the FSM have witnessed firsthand the toll taken by sea level rise and other adverse impacts of climate change. And we note more so for our brothers and sisters on the atolls in Kiribati Tuvalu and Marshall Islands. All of us are developing plans for adaptation to climate change. However, all the planning in the world will do us no good if we do not find ways to address the root cause of the problem by finding collective ways to reduce greenhouse gases and other climate change pollutants right now. The FSM has enacted a climate change law and adopted an integrated disaster risk reduction and climate change policy. We have also contributed to some innovative proposals for climate change mitigation to the ongoing international negotiations. For most and among, there is our proposed amendment to the Montreal Protocol to face down production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, because if adopted, this strategy would complement reductions of CO2 emissions and would provide fast action mitigation because most of HFCs are much more potent than CO2s but do not last in the atmosphere very long. Furthermore, it would slow or halt the climate warming and rising sea levels across the globe. We believe that a victory on HFCs under Montreal Protocol next year would build critical momentum for a successful outcome at the UNFCCC COP21 in Paris next year. We, are also, we also continue to pin high hopes on the world community to address long-term problem of CO2 emissions under the UNFCC. Reducing CO2 is paramount for controlling warming and the acidification that is affecting health of our ocean. We are encouraged by the recent developments with respect to the Green Climate Fund and progress last week in Bonn. 
I commend and congratulate the United States for proposing new rules to regulate emissions from existing power plants. That is what is driving the Federated States of Micronesia, to find complementary ways to address the already occurring impacts of warming and damages to sea level rise. We can no longer sit idle. We must take fast action now while we can, and we must succeed with the Paris COP next year as well. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, I'll be remiss if I, not, if I do not thank New Zealand through you, Ambassador, and the staff of the embassy for your vision, your leadership, your kindness, and your hospitality for hosting us this afternoon. And then, of course, to all those who are involved in organizing this event, I thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Foreign Minister Robert. We're going to now uh, segue into a panel discussion, so could I please invite our panelists to come up here and get mic'd up, please? So, so while they get mic'd up, I'll just make a few brief introductory comments. The, the theme of this uh, panel discussion is, this year is partnerships. Uh, you've heard this theme. Okay, sorry. You, you've started to hear this theme from our introductory speakers already about the importance of Pacific uh, countries working together collectively to do things they couldn't do individually, that to ad address uh, issues of resources and to achieve. Uh, uh, peace and security and economic prosperity. Many of the challenges facing the Pacific Islands and other SIDSs are shared by the international community, including climate change, oceans and seas, natural disasters, and sustainable economic development. So these are some of the uh, themes that we're going to uh, take, uh, tackle in, the, in this panel. We have a distinguished panel of five different speakers. They'll each speak uh, briefly. I'll introduce them serially as they speak, and, uh, and then we'll have a, a Q&A when they're finished. Our first uh, speaker is Ambassador, New Zealand Ambassador for Pacific Economic Development, Mr. Shane Jones. Ambassador Jones, please. You can, you can sit if you like, or you can come up if you prefer, okay. Uh, Greetings on the Moana Nui Kiwa Day, Pacific Day. I want to make like I said, man, I can screech without the need of this apparatus. <laughs> I've had nine years as a politician. I've got a degree in screeching. Um, to, uh, the, uh, to the various ambassadors, uh, President of Palo, greetings. Ambassador Moore and your team here for supporting this day. Greetings. Uh, I have just come into this um, role over the last month or so, having moved on from being a parliamentarian in New Zealand. So I shall confine my remarks to the key themes that emerged from the Oceans Conference and provide an opportunity for the other speakers who have probably got greater bragging rights than I have in this particular area. 
But without a doubt, the um, hosting of the conference has provided a platform to highlight issues of particular significance to the Pacific. The uh, focus on ocean acidification really needs to be amplified when we do all arrive at the SIDS conference in Samoa. The uh, importance of regulating better and extracting greater value out of the fisheries of the Pacific. You know, we have a host of reports. We have had a host of very clever advisors wander through the Pacific. But I want to acknowledge James Mowbray, who will soon be speaking in New Zealand. James, I want you to know you are regarded as a highly competent expert on Pacific fisheries because often the challenges taking from our rhetoric operational problems that ca pro programs that can be embraced and put into practice in our various jurisdictions and I also want to before I wind up acknowledge the Micronesian Fano people that are here today it was the navigator Mal from Micronesia who in 1984 after the Hawaiian voyaging canoe, waka, came to New Zealand that worked with our Māori tribes and enabled us to rejuvenate an art that had been lost to us in the time of my grandparents. And Māo, the master navigator of the Pacific, worked with our Māori elders and now we have a host of ocean-going waka that traverse the Pacific, but uh, much of it is attributed to the efforts of that particular walking encyclopedia from your part of the Pacific. He was someone that we respected and dearly loved. I just want to finish up by encouraging a strong delegation from um, the community of the United States, either NGO, business people, or professional government advisors to come down to Samoa because the role that you appear to be claiming to provide some leadership to the rest of the world and um, work with us to generate solutions in the Pacific cannot be left to a single event. And it ought not to be left just to the next Oceans Conference in Chile. I would encourage you to bring a strong delegation to SIDS and work with those of us who are dealing with these challenges in the Pacific every single week i.e. better wealth from fisheries and enhancing the sustainability of the fisheries and driving better scientific platforms to better understand how we should derive solutions in our own space to deal with ocean acidification and obviously the, uh, the ills of climate change. Uh, others will have more to say. As I said, my name is Shane Jones. And after nine years in politics, I find this audience very much more friendly. Thank you very much. <laughs> Pastor Jones, thank you very much. Our, our next speaker is James Movick, who is the new Director General of the Forum on F Fisheries Agency. Uh, Mr. Movick, do you want to speak there from there? Or no, you, come you come there? OK, thank you, please. Thank you, MC and President Ramangasau, Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, uh, ladies and gentlemen. After the Ambassador's kind endorsement, I suppose I better try to sound like I'm smart. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you very much for inviting me to, to talk at this occasion. And I'm very happy to be here in Washington to talk with you and, and share with you some of the story of what we are doing in Pacific fisheries. Uh, and in the process, I would like to convey to you that while oftentimes we paint a rather dire picture, uh, that in fact there are a lot of positives and successes that we have, uh, that we can also point to and that we should take uh, strength and comfort from as we continue the challenge of managing and utilizing the tuna resources, in particular the oceanic resources since that's the uh, responsibility of my agency. 
uh, in the Pacific. So what is FFA? The, it's not the future farmers of America. It's the, the Pacific Island Forum Fisheries Agency is a small intergovernmental organization uh, comprised of a partnership of the 17 Pacific Island uh, countries and the territory of Tokelau, including uh, Australia and New Zealand. The FFA was established in uh, 1978, which for those of you who know the law of the sea will realize was before the final ratification of the United Nations Conference on the Law of the Sea. And this was a very deliberate move by the leaders of the Pacific at the time to assert their national sovereignty through the mechanism of the extension of the 200 mile uh, exclusive economic zones. And it, it put into place the very solid legal regime of national zones and, and national sovereignty and jurisdiction over zones and through working in a cooperative manner in the Foreign Fisheries Agency, forging these links, uh, cooperative arrangements between them, common actions, common attitudes, and common positions, in order to build what has become the most effective tuna management regime in the entire world. It is the reason why the Western Central Pacific still has the most robust of all of the international tuna fisheries regimes in the world. And it all stems to the fact that the islanders took control of this resource and built, built it based on their common understanding of their national interest and the realization that in order to effectively manage a highly migratory resource, we had to combine and cooperate our meager resources to face up to the rest of the world and to have uh, sufficient reach over this, this uh, highly migratory regional resource. But it, it's that lesson, and people who don't understand the importance of national sovereignty in the approach that we've taken to fisheries management in the region and the success that is built, if you don't understand, you can never understand fully uh, why we've been a success and why we maintain the kinds of positions that we do in the, uh, in the international tuna regime and, and uh, associated arrangements around the world. I've already explained why we need uh, partnerships in tuna fisheries. Uh, this is uh, supposed to be a session where we talk of uh, the, the role of partnerships and the usefulness of partnerships, particularly in this year of uh, SIDS uh, 3, where partnerships is the common theme. But it is this fundamental partnership amongst the, the Pacific Island countries, which is the most important. And the lesson from that is that we must continue to maintain that. Sure, we have internal differences amongst ourselves. But we've always found ways in which to be able to come together to try to reconcile those differences, to understand where we have differences, and to put those aside and to focus on those things that we can do together and that we are prepared to do together. And then as we gain more success, we come back to the more difficult uh, aspects of the relationship and we continue to improve upon those. And the lesson here for those in the international community who are coming increasingly into the region uh, to provide assistance, particularly now that oceans is in, co in, in, in a political common currency. This is the area to be in if you want to get support, etc. So I anticipate we will get a lot of interest in the region in this area. But the fundamental point that I want to make uh, here is that those who come into the region to help us need to understand that there are existing regional institutional arrangements that have helped the Pacific Island countries and by which we've been able to develop as successfully as we have up to this point. The, uh, the Foreign Fisheries Agency obviously is, is the peak body with the leaders of the region coming together. And we have a number of institutional arrangements and organizations within that. Uh, where governments have developed over a period of 35 or 40 years that have been very effective. And so for those of you who are looking to come into the region to increase the level of your assistance and support and engagement, I encourage you first to realize that there is an existing regional institutional framework and to utilize that rather than to think that you can come into the region and reinvent the wheel. Because I think if there is one lesson I've learned in the week prior to this at, at the FAO in, uh, in Rome, at the uh, Committee on Fisheries, and even over the past two days, is that we have actually developed a number of, in, uh, of arrangements in the Pacific that are at the forefront of international practice and that are increasingly being recognized as such. So I give you some examples of what it is that we have done and that we do that makes our fisheries regime relatively successful. Not a total success. We can't be complacent. Overfishing can occur 
if we are not, if we're not diligent and, and, and vigilant in watching out for this. In the, t in the area of uh, MCS, or Monitoring, Control, and Surveillance, we have developed a vessel monitoring scheme uh, using satellites to track boats that goes uh, back to the early 80s. I noticed uh, in the conference in the last two days there was much highlighting of some of the development that is taking place more recently in, the, uh, in Africa and the Indian Ocean. Well, we've been doing this since the early 80s, and a lot of what is being done elsewhere is actually being uh, modeled on what we have established in the Pacific. We've since developed a picture where we're able to have effective oversight of, of most of the operations in the region using a number of different modalities, both our own vessel monitoring system, utilizing the IMO uh, automatic identification system for larger vessels that are not necessarily fishing vessels. So we've got a fairly good picture of every vessel that has some kind of automatic uh, location transponder on board it crossing the region. We're then able to support that using occasional uh, operations where through the kind partnership of the what we call the Quad, which are the uh, Naval and Coast Guard forces of Australia, New Zealand, the United States, and France. We run periodic surveillance operations through the Pacific where we're able to deploy boats and aircraft to actually go out and surveil the fishing grounds and apprehend and bring boats in. And what we have seen in the seven or eight years that we have been doing this is a remarkable reduction in the level of, of IUU activity in terms of purely illegal boats fishing out there. What we have seen and what is still a threat in the Pacific is the underreporting element. Uh, there are not too many pirate boats out there in our estimation. I think the U.S. industry representatives in the conference on Monday pointed out that it, it's probably at the most not more than 10 percent, and, and that's even uh, broader than just the Pacific tuna fishery. But where the problem lies is in underreporting of catch, the, the, the late reporting of catch, because this affects the science uh, that we use in order to determine the, uh, the acceptable levels of fishing that we, we agree to on an annualized basis. And unfortunately, most of the problem here does not lie with the island countries or within the management uh, systems that we uh, insist on for the boats that fish within our exclusive economic zones. But the bulk of the problem that we have been seeing in the last couple of years are with distant water fishing boats operating primarily in the areas beyond national jurisdiction or in the high seas areas. And this is the threat. And we have offered a number of solutions in the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission and internationally to allow for the purposes of tuna management, not in order to impede the freedom of navigation, but for the purposes of more effective tuna management to uh, provide for a greater management closure of the high seas to fishing and an allocation of the rights for fishing on the high seas to the adjacent coastal states who have the principal interest and, and ca uh, capacity uh, to manage this resource effectively. It's perhaps a novel idea, but I think under the fabric of both the law of the sea and the fish stock agreement and realizing that, uh, that we've got to look at tools such as this as the way forward to close off this one area uh, of, uh, of threat, of continuing threat. In terms of management, in the Pacific we have seen the creation of some very innovative uh, systems of rights-based management, uh, in particular with the PNA Vessel Day Scheme, or the VDS, whereby we have set a total management limit for the area, uh, uh, limits on effort uh, within the area encompassed by the um, participating parties, uh, and we allocate those rights amongst the participating parties. And because tuna is a highly migratory resource, if the tuna stocks fish to the east or the west, we are able to sell and trade days between ourselves to always ensure that within the total allowable catch that we have set, uh, the fishing uh, activity is, is able to take place um, through, these, uh, through this mechanism. As a result, we have seen a 300% increase in the level of fishing access fees over just the last four years. And uh, with the recently announced, uh, with the recent announcement by the parties of the Nauru Agreement to uh, increase the, the current uh, vessel day rate by, what is it, almost 60%, uh, uh, we will see a, an even more significant increase in the, uh, in the access fees that are be de being derived by these island nations. But the system of, uh, we are also putting into place a similar arrangement uh, for the southern albacore fishery. It, it's taking us about 30 years to persuade the members uh, that share the southern albacore fishery stock 
that they need to get together, agree on collective limits, national limits, and a collective limit overall, and to begin to face the rest of the world in a more unified manner, just as the PNA countries have done for the Perth Saint fishery. So again, these are, are developments that are attracting international attention, and uh, we can be very proud of the inroads that have been made by the Pacific in this regard. This particularly struck me in, um, in Rome last week at the uh, uh, Committee on Fisheries when we were approached by a number of different delegations from uh, Africa, from the Indian Ocean, and the Director General of, the, uh, of FAO also invited me to, to attend the, uh, the Caribbean Ministers of Fisheries meeting next year in order to explain more about what we are doing in terms of MCS. So the lessons that we have learned in the Pacific, the models that we have created, are uh, getting the, the type of international attention and support uh, that, that is long overdue. I think one of our problems in the Pacific region is that we tend to be too modest. We focus on all the problems and difficulties we continue to have instead of celebrating the successes. And I think in fisheries, at least in the tuna fisheries area, there is a lot for the region to be proud of and to be able to stand up on its own feet and say we deserve to be treated not as supplicants with their hand out always seeking aid, but rather as people who have a resource, who have managed this resource responsibly, and who want to derive the value from that resource that we are entitled to as the managers of, the, of that resource. The, um, in, in doing this, I realize I'm probably taking more time, and I, I'm the kind of person who can talk about tuna for the next two days. So if, if any of you are interested, uh, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to do that, but I realize I will run out of time and goodwill here if I continue much more. But I did just want to address some of the myths that have developed, that, that there is this rampant IUU fishing out there. It is far more controlled in the Pacific region than in many other regions, in the tuna fishery in particular. And so we should, while not being complacent, we should recognize that fact. Uh, similarly, uh, as I've said, with, with regard to, um, uh, well, as I haven't said yet, but the rate of return. We've often complained about the fact that we aren't making a, an adequate rate of return on the resource. But for a rate of return on a basic commodity uh, product, if you're just taking the raw fish that is extracted from our waters, uh, and, and there is about $3.4 billion worth of tuna from the, F from the FFA member EEZs, uh, which is more than half of the catch of the Western Central Pacific Ocean, we gain about $240 million in access fee revenues at the present time. And this constitutes about 60% go of government revenues in one country and is more than 10% of the national budget for another four. So that's the importance of the revenues from, from tuna fishing access that is derived at the present time. And on an on a industry-wide basis, this is around about 7% at the present time that we're moving towards. Uh, we should be going up to about 10 or 12%, which, as many people tell me, for a commodity pro uh, product is a fairly decent rate of return. But in our view, that is not sufficient. We believe that we have a right to enjoy the value of the fish all the way up to the end point of sale, all the way through the value chain, and we are now putting into place mechanisms that will allow us to leverage access to this resource in return for a greater return of the total value of the uh, tuna product. I'd just like to just finish by uh, acknowledging some of the key partnerships. Besides the partnership that has existed amongst the Pacific Island countries themselves, which is, of course, the key to, to everything that we're doing and the success we have, not only in fisheries, but all sectors of the region. I uh, want to thank Aus uh, New Zealand and, and Australia for the, the funding support way beyond what they're in, uh, uh, obliged to provide as, as their contribution, but the additional support that they've continued to give us through the years, not only in terms of financial support, but also in terms of the, the uh, naval uh, operations and the various fisheries operations that we run. Uh, the United States of America, uh, with whom we've had a very long and, and uh, mutually uh, productive relationship through the form of the U.S. Tuna Treaty for the last uh, 25 years or more. Uh, we have uh, the assistance of the partnership of the United States in the area of, uh, of the uh, surveillance operations as well, including having one of the um, uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft carrier task forces that was coming through the region actually send off some of their uh, aircraft. I don't know what the latest form of naval jet is, an F-15 or something uh, even more uh, sinister than that. 
Uh, so can you imagine being on a small fishing boat out at sea and having these jets just, just uh, fly over your head and buzz you? Because that's actually what the pilots did. They didn't have onboard cameras that they could use, so they used handheld cameras and buzzed these fishing boats taking photos. So that must have been quite a scene, but it, it probably instilled in the fishermen's mind, don't mess around with these Pacific Islanders. They've got a lot of clout. So I also, just uh, the final one is to make this issue of South-South cooperation. As I said in, uh, in Rome last week, uh, what I was really gratified by was the recognition of what we are doing and the desire on the part of other people in Africa, the Indian Ocean, uh, and through the Director General of FAO, uh, some possibility also of the Caribbean uh, that we could assist, asking for our help, seeking to learn from the models and the experience in the Pacific. And I think this is the best uh, testament to the success and the hard work that Pacific Islanders have built in over the last 35 years in the management of this resource. So, Chair, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Movic. Our next speaker is um, Mr. Charles Feinstein, who's the uh, sector management manager for water and energy at the World Bank's East Asia and Pacific Sustainable Development Department. Please, Mr. Okay, Feinstein. Sorry, I'll, I think I'll, if the mic's on, I'll take my punishment sitting down. Um, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I mean that sincerely. I've spent about 12 years of my career working on, in, and with the Pacific, primarily on sustainable energy issues. I worked in uh, Micronesia, Samoa, Hawaii, and most recently out of Sydney working on the Pacific region. I'm going to try and give you a brief overview or set the context, a couple of snapshots of the situation of energy in the Pacific. First, uh, access to modern energy, commonly electricity, is quite high. Pacific generally does well particularly in Polynesia, 95 to 98% of the population in places like Samoa and Tonga have access to electricity. But there are big pockets, principally in Melanesia. Papua New Guinea, electrification rates 13%. In the Solomons, 20%. Vanuatu, 27%. Um, electricity and modern energy is a big enabler of, of poverty reduction and growth. So that is a, a huge challenge. And most of the electricity or modern energy that exists is based on imported fossil fuels. Many islands import 98% of their energy needs. Second, the share of renewable energy and the resources that are abundant in the Pacific is really quite low. The only real renewable source of energy is basically cooking fuel, fuel wood. Um, other resources such as hydropower at any scale, wind, solar, geothermal, are scarcely exploited today. Thirdly, energy intensity is high. What do I mean by that? The amount of principally petroleum that's consumed to produce a unit of economic output. And there's a false belief that, hey, we don't use much energy, so how can we save it? But in reality, the, the scope to improve efficiency is really quite quite vast. Now I think the question on the table for the Pacific is, is energy a driver or an impediment to sustainable development? Well, let me just outline some of the challenges. First off, the region faces some of the highest energy costs in the world. Um, it's common to see the cost of generation of electricity to be between 30 to 60 cents a kilowatt hour. And the irony is, as I tell my team, my guys, if you can't make it here in promoting renewable energy, you can't make it anywhere in the world. Because I don't know of a single renewable energy technology that costs that much. So it's not a pure technology or economics problem. Um, ironically, there's, a, there's a, an irony here that many Pacific Islands nations have poverty rates in excess of 20%. And these people pay among the most for energy services. It's like the irony of shopping for groceries here in Washington, DC. Where are the highest prices for groceries? In the poorest areas. It's not in Bethesda, it's in Anacostia. And there's a parallel to the Pacific. A second major issue for the Pacific is what I call energy vulnerability. 
these are some of the most vulnerable countries in the world to oil price shock. And we saw that in, for example, 2008, when oil prices went up by a factor of eight and brought many specific economies to their knees. In fact, even today, uh, the cost of fuel imports is somewhere in the range of 12 to 37 percent of the import bills, total import bills of Pacific nations. And compounding that issue is that island states face the threat of physical cutoff. Supply interruptions, for example, due to accidents or storms, and climate change is going to exacerbate that threat because the supply chains are very long and very costly. Third challenge is what I would categorize as fiscal imbalances. So looking at a macroeconomic level, Pacific Islands are some of the most indebted and aid-dependent countries in the world. And in fact, if you take the combined effect of debt service and the cost of principally oil imports, that's 60 to 70 percent of their GDP. And again, a lot of that has been driven by the recent rise of oil prices, and I don't think they're going, they're not going to reverse course. Um, let me quickly move on to the partnership angle. Um, you know, to answer my question, I do think today energy is more of an impediment to sustainable development, but it's still an opportunity on the table. And the partnership that's fundamentally required, I think, is between governments and the development partner, the donor community. And there are weaknesses on both sides. Governments tend to take an ad hoc approach to energy planning and investment. There are very poorly developed avenues for private sector participation, which can be not only a source of technology, but of capital and risk taking. On the donor side, donors tend to take also a somewhat ad hoc and poorly coordinated approach among each other. And I could tell you the story of when we went out to Tonga about five years ago as the World Bank to ask at high levels of government, what could we do to assist in the energy sector? And it was a horror story. I mean, the senior official said, we deal with 13 energy donors, assistance agents, agencies currently. And each has their own view of the situation and their own, frankly, pet projects. And we got together with, with the prime minister and basically issued a declaration, or the government did, to the donor community. This will not stand. Business as usual will no longer be business as usual. And we adopted an approach which has now been enshrined by the SPC as the lead energy assistance or energy coordination agency in the Pacific. And that is around the concept of one team, many players, one plan, one game plan. So Tonga has now adopted, they've gone through a very rigorous least cost planning process designed to reduce dependence on energy imports, promote energy efficiency, and renewable energy. And these 13 donors, we all now sit around one table. And while we don't all finance every part of the plan, we are financing various pieces in a coordinated way. And bless their hearts, at least so far, after five years, the Tongans have stuck with it. And we've had some small victories. Uh, a lot of this work has been supported by Australia and New Zealand. And, and recently, uh, about a year ago, I believe, uh, under New Zealand assistance, the Tongans uh, commissioned their first major centralized solar photovoltaic plant, and that's reducing oil imports in the electricity sector by 15 percent. So that's a start, and it just shows you what can be done through an enhanced partnership approach. Thank you. is uh, Ambassador Gayan Acharya, who is the Under Secretary General and High Representative for the Least Developed Countries, Landlocked Developing Countries, and Small Island Developing States. That's quite a title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Acharya was the former, uh, pre pri prior to this job, served as permanent representative in Nepal to the United Nations. Ambassador Acharya, you can either stay seated or come up here. Your choice. Oh, thank you. I think I'll do it from here. Okay. Uh, President of Palau, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to this event. I think the timing of this specific night is propitious. The last two days, the city was abuzzed with the leaders from all walks of life, talking about the health of the oceans, planet, and people in a holistic manner. And this year is shaping up uh, to be a landmark year for SIDS. 
Uh, first, the UN General Assembly has de designated 2014 as the International Year of SIDS, the first time the UN has designated such an honor for a group of countries. Second, the third United Na International Conference on SIDS will be convened in Apia, Samoa, this September 1-4, and the PIF Summit is taking place, we just heard, in Palau, which would contribute to include specific perspectives just before that. I think the preparations for the conference is progressing well. The outcome of the conference is being negotiated by the member states. Under the advocacy mandate for SITS, my office is tasked with jointly organizing with the government of independent state of Samoa, a private sector partnerships forum. We are all aware that the future we want outcome of the Rio 20 process acknowledge the need for a broad alliance of all the stakeholders for sustainable development. I think that certainly includes the private sector, civil society, the communities if sustainable development is to be a priority, is, is to be a reality. The private sector forum will be looking at bringing together some of the private sector alliances, women and youth entrepreneurs for partnership in Samoa. It has six uh, sectoral themes, oceans and marine resources, sustainable agriculture, connectivity, such as ICT and transportation, renewable energy, sustainable tourism, and disaster risk management. There will be a seventh session that will focus on cross-cutting issues of financing including inclusive finance, women in business, and youth entrepreneurship. The objective of the uh, private sector forum is to showcase best practices, scale up private sector initiatives already underway, announce new private sector partnerships in SITSITS, SITS and development partners, both traditional and emerging, and public-private partnerships. This forum aims to have a number of concrete partnerships announced under each of the sectoral themes. Uh, we hope that the forum will add value to the intergovernmental process that will follow from 1 to 4 September. There will be also a high-level dialogue segment on 31st August, allowing for discussions between political leaders and business leaders. We know that the business environment is critical, and it is dependent on national policies, regulatory frameworks, and institutional arrangements. The segment will be chaired by the Prime Minister of Samoa. As to the conference proper, of course, the theme of the sustainable development of SIRS through genuine and durable partnerships is an apt one. SIRS have emphasized that in order for them to achieve their sustainable development aspirations, they will continue to rely on genuine and durable partnerships. Collaborative efforts at all levels with a long-term and holistic approach is key to success in SIRS. Uh, New Zealand's one strong support to Samoa in hosting the conference is commendable, and we hope that the conference comes at an opportune, uh, comes with an, as, with an outcome that is really implementable with a strong focus on acts and plans. I think the conference also is an opportune, uh, you know, the moment for SITS to also contribute towards the broader dialogue on the post-2015 development agenda, which is being discussed at the UN. Uh, this discussions on the SDGs is immensely relevant to SITS as they see and face sustainability challenge on a daily basis. There is a need to ensure SITS angle to these targets and goals of the SDGs, and this is something that the SITS conference could bring to the ongoing discussions. One of the important things to remind ourselves is that SITS are on the front line of many of the global challenges. When you look at and deal with the SITS challenges, we are not only looking at it from the equity perspective, which we should be, but much more than that, we will be also effectively contributing to the global sustainability development agenda. Therefore, we have to see it from a broader perspective for SITS themselves as well as for the global community as a whole. In today's globalized world, one thing we have learned clearly is that there is nothing like a separate local issue and the global issue. I think they are all intertwined. All have to play a role. I'm glad the number of initiatives are underway in SITS in marine protected areas, fishing, and energy. We heard that. A strong multi-stakeholder national leadership and global partnership is the only way forward. I had a pleasure to represent the Secretary General in last year's Pacific Island Leaders Forum in Majuro, where I saw firsthand that SITS and small little islands like Marshalls are on the front lines of facing the climate change challenges. The Leaders Majuro Declaration Climate Leadership, which was presented to the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon last September, is highly commendable. SITS are the moral voice on the urgency to address the climate change as well as the health of the oceans as its custodian. And we fully agree that small islands are indeed large ocean estates, which is coming up very strongly in the UN debate as well. This September 23rd, the Secretary General will be hosting the Climate Summit under the theme Catalyzing Action in New York. We look forward to receiving many of SITS leaders in the summit and continue to look forward towards more initiatives that leaders could announce at that summit. I think this should be very important to generate a stronger global political will that is required to have an ambitious agreement in Paris. SITS continue to be a special case as recognized in 92 Rio onset. 
my office will continue to advocate for this special case as we move towards Samoa, but will continue our mandate even as we come away from Samoa. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Ambassador Charia. Our next speaker is Ms. Sylvia Reed Curran, who is the Special Advisor on Indigenous Engagement in the Race, Ethnicity, and Social Inclusion Unit of, of Policy Planning in the State Department. You also have a pretty hefty title. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Curran, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll also speak from here. Um, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Washington, D.C. Pacific Committee for the invitation. Uh, I have to admit that the invitation came as a bit of a surprise. Uh, unlike the other members of the panel, I am not an expert on Pacific Island issues. Uh, I'm familiar with the Pacific. Uh, I've lived previously in Hawaii. I have family in Hawaii. I've traveled throughout the Pacific. Uh, my last overseas assignment, I was the U.S. Consul General in Vladivostok, Russia, was, which was in the North Pacific. <laughs> 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 and uh, one of our most pleasurable responsibilities in Vladivostok was promoting tourism to Guam. So we, we really enjoyed that part of our job. The theme of today's panel is partnerships. Uh, the Pacific Plan goals state that uh, working collectively to do more than one could do separately, manage shared resources to achieve shared goals of peace, harmony, security, and economic prosperity. I think those goals, which are achieved through collaboration, are important for all regions of the world. And as our world becomes more interconnected as it should, the only way to really meet the challenges that have an impact on us all is through partnerships and collaboration. I currently work on Western Hemisphere Affairs. And like its ties with its partners throughout the world, the United States of America values its ties to Latin America and the Caribbean. And those ties are important to the collective future of the hemisphere. Partnerships in the Western Hemisphere are vital to our shared economic competitiveness and prosperity, vital to our ability to solve the transnational challenges that no country can solve on its own and vital to the global consolidation of democracy and human rights. I'd like to share with you today several of the partnership programs that we have in the Western Hemisphere. The first one I want to talk about is 100,000 strong in the Americas. We are very proud of President Obama's 100,000 strong in the Americas initiative which seeks to build a more competitive, interconnected region by supporting 100,000 student exchanges annually between the US and our partners in the hemisphere by 2020. And that would be 100,000 US students studying in Latin America and the Caribbean, and 100,000 students from those countries studying in the United States. It also aims to dramatically increase the number and diversity of student exchanges across the hemisphere. Investing in education and opportunities for our young people is investing in our hemisphere's future. The initiative will offer our young people the chance to build the skills and networks they need to compete in this globalized world. The Department of State is working to implement 100,000 strong in the Americas through partnerships with foreign governments, with universities and colleges, and with the private sector. Education USA, a network of more than 100 US government supported advising centers throughout the Western Hemisphere, is a centerpiece of our partnership and outreach efforts. 
We are working with Latin American and Caribbean governments, universities, and the private sector to provide international study opportunities for students from disadvantaged backgrounds or historically underserved populations. Pathways to Prosperity in the Americas. Pathways countries include Belize, <coughs> Canada, Chile, Colombia, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Peru, Uruguay, and the United States. Brazil and Trinidad and Tobago have observer status. The Inter-American Development Bank and the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean are strategic pathways partners. Pathways countries recognize that while trade spurs economic growth for our countries, the gains from trade have not been equitably shared and the promise of economic and social opportunity remains elusive for too many people in this hemisphere. Pathways seeks to close this gap by empowering small farmers, small businesses, craftspeople, workers, women, indigenous communities, Afro-descendants, youth and vulnerable groups to participate effectively in the global economy. Pathways is designed to help countries learn from one another's experience through the exchange of best practices for spreading the benefits of economic growth broadly to all of our citizens. Pathways partner countries are committed to deepening cooperation by expanding opportunities in particular for small businesses, farmers, and rural communities, deepening the trade architecture to facilitate regional trade and, trans and integration, expanding cooperation on development and competitiveness, enhancing cooperation on labor and environment, expanding educational opportunities, promoting public-private partnerships, and ensuring the effective enforcement of fundamental labor rights and decent working conditions and the effective enforcement of environmental laws. We're excited about the Pathways Innovation Challenge, which seeks to unlock the potential of small and medium enterprises in the hemisphere. And we are proud to support the Inter-American Social Protection Network, which promotes best practices on social protection and access to basic services for vulnerable groups across the region. The State Department's targeted assistance efforts in Pathways to Prosperity in the Americas raised $98.5 million in credit for small and medium-sized businesses in Mexico, El Salvador, and Nicaragua. And in Mexico alone, we trained 150 William, uh, women entrepreneurs and facilitated $6.5 million in new sales for them. We Americas, women's entrepreneurship in the Americas. Investing in women-owned small and medium-sized enterprises is one of the best ways to achieve economic, financial, and social impact. Research shows that women-owned SMEs are significant accelerators of economic growth, as women tend to spend more of their earned income than men on the health and education of their families. As a result, women-owned SMEs yield significant social impact and bolster future gains in productivity. First launched in 2012, we worked with our founding partners, which came from private business, non-governmental organizations, academia, and multilateral banking to provide women entrepreneurs with access to networks, access to finance, and access to markets. Our founding partners included the Sherry Blair Foundation for Women, Exxon Mobil Foundation, Goldman Sachs, 10,000 Women, Inter-American Development Bank, Thunderbird School of Global Management, Vital Voices, Walmart Foundation, and We Connect International. We Americas makes grants to reduce the barriers women entrepreneurs face. For example, the IDB and the Multilateral Investment Fund partner to launch Women Entrepreneurship Banking, an initiative to help financial institutions deploy innovative lending models that support women-owned SMEs. Multilateral Investment Fund is providing up to five million in technical assistance grants to transfer knowledge of effective lending models for women-owned SMEs and to train 
loan officers, and credit managers in these products and services. The IDB, through its financial market strategy, Beyond Banking Program, is offering up to $50 million in loans, risk-taking facilities, and partial credit guarantees. Moreover, the ExxonMobil Foundation and the U.S. Department of State have provided grants to WeConnect International to support their work registering and certifying women-owned businesses in Mexico. Through its work with the Subcommittee on Access to Markets on the Secretary's International Council of Women Business Leaders, WeConnect has also worked to provide women-owned businesses in Brazil, Chile, Mexico, and Peru with market access opportunities. America's Partnership for Social Inclusion and Equality. Under the America's Partnership for Social Inclusion and Equality, we're also funding projects to build the capacity of vulnerable groups in Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Paraguay, and Peru. Clean Energy Financing Forum for Central America. In 2013, three entrepreneurs secured $14 million in private financing to launch their clean energy projects through the Clean Energy Financing Forum for Central America, an event sponsored by the State Department. The keys to all these programs, the key to all these programs is partnership. The ability to build these links, not just between governments, but also with private business, with academia, with uh, international uh, organizations, in order to promote the prosperity and better standards for all. Thank you. Ms. Curran, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now have a few minutes for questions, so uh, please, uh, like the drill was before, raise your hand to identify yourself uh, by, by name and affiliation if possible. Any questions out there? We had a very um, diverse set of uh, uh, interventions by our various panelists, and so there's a lot of food for thought. I'm sure some of you have questions. Anybody to feed? Sorry. Thank you, uh, Sala Panapasa, research scientist at the University of Michigan Institute for Social Research. And my question is directed to um, uh, Dr. Curran. Um, and uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, opportunity for the Americas. And certainly thanks to the President and the State Department for its leadership in uh, uh, taking the lead, cultivating, and building partnerships uh, that would help empower um, the communities in the Ameri you know, in Latin America, and, um, so that they too can become uh, competitive uh, in a global economy. So my question is. Um, is this a program and option that is that our Pacific leaders uh, can consider so that the program can be expanded to include the communities and populations in the Pacific Island nations, whereby they too can benefit, uh, reap the benefits through the investment of building local capacities um, and uh, participate in similar pathway programs so that they too someday will become competitive, will have the skills to be able to advocate for the ocean and the land and the needs of the local people. So, you know, I'm a research scientist. Um, I am familiar of NI, and I would like to use an example of the National Institutes on Health whereby there are uh, programs and investments in research in, um, de other deve in developing countries. I have yet to see special uh, program, funding programs directed to Pacific Island countries. So my question is really, 
um, if, you know, if there is a commitment uh, or a commitment can be made for consideration by the leaders of the Pacific, is this an option whereby we, the Pacific Island nations too can participate and benefit in such a program? Because certainly the need is Thank you. there. Thank and you. We Let's have let the her evidence. answer the question. Thank Please. you. Thank you. <laughs> She's the enthusiast. Okay. Uh, first of all, th thank you very much for your question. Uh, as I mentioned, I work on Western Hemisphere affairs. And I think that uh, that question should be uh, directed to our colleagues who work in the uh, East Asian and Pacific Bureau, because they're the ones who work on this issue. Uh, so I, I, I cannot speak for them. I know that this is, these programs have been very beneficial in, in, in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, many of them are, are new, as I've stated, when some are just uh, a couple of years old. But, and we have very strong goals because of the importance of partnerships and working with them. I, I know that we also value our partnerships with our colleagues and friends in the Pacific, but I, I can't speak for another bureau. Thank you. There's a question here. Please. Um, I, I have a laptop, I can't really stand up. Um, I'm Henry Gass, I'm a reporter at Climate Wire, um, and uh, I was had a question about um, partnerships among Pacific Islands and how that uh, translates on sort of the international um, relations scene. Um, I was wondering, we've talked a bit about sort of the US, his recent commitment to uh, cutting CO2 emissions, and I was wondering if uh, your partnerships, uh, if you're looking to engage with other big polluting countries like China, India, for example, on working on that as well, sort of how your partnerships are uh, going to manifest themselves uh, on the international stage as well. Uh, hi, Shane Jones. My answer will be very brief because there's a famous tradition in New Zealand, do not stand between an audience, drink and poop. <laughs> New Zealand has a successful joint project with the Chinese dealing with freshwater reticulation and freshwater sanitation in the Cook Islands. Uh, we're conscious that 4.23 million people in the southern portion of the Pacific, we do need to partner, not only with established um, parties, but in terms of um, the Chinese interest in the Pacific. That's a small example where we're endeavoring in the Pacific to find projects where we can work together. Uh, has it had much coverage? Yeah, perhaps a little in our part of the world. It would appear that it hasn't be, uh, uh, enjoyed any coverage in the media that you represent in this part of the world. That's a small but uh, workable proposition that I think that the Cook Island uh, governments and families are deriving some benefit from. Any of, any of the other panelists want to uh, answer? Yeah, I'll give someone else another opportunity to ask Chris. Back there. David Shepard, uh, Sprep, just picking up uh, James's comment that we're often too modest. I think that is true. I think there's many innovative and exciting initiatives in the Pacific. Micronesian Challenge, initiatives such as the locally managed marine areas, renewable energy, Tokelau 100% uh, solar energy. So I think we should use the SIDS conference to highlight these. And all of these, in fact, are based on partnerships in the region between countries, donors, civil society. I think also SIDS conference, we need to look at how we can strengthen the partnerships between Caribbean, Pacific, Indian Ocean. We have some examples. The AOSIS uh, work for the climate negotiations is a good one. The SIDSTOC, the Cross-Regional Renewable Energy Initiative is another. I think we need to look and use SIDS conference in a way that we strengthen cross-regional collaboration. 
particularly with a view to maximum influence on the Millennium Development Goal relating to oceans and also the Paris Conference next year. So, sorry, not a, not a question but a, but a comment and observation backing up the uh, excellent presentations. Thank you. I think what we're going to do is, uh, because we're expecting a uh, uh, couple of prominent uh, officials to arrive momentarily, what we're going to do is, is uh, uh, adjourn this panel, and then Patricia, Patricia Tumbarello, of the, uh, who's the chief of the Pacific Islands Unit of the Asia Pacific Department at the IMF International Monetary Fund, will make a few concluding comments. Thank Thank you, Chair, and I'm um, delighted to be here this afternoon. I want to thank um, the New Zealand Embassy and the organizer um, for this remarkable event. This is my fourth year here, and I think that the, you're raising the bar every year. <coughs> I would like to uh, summarize some of the takeaways from, uh, from the, the, the panelists. It was a very rich um, discussion. Very briefly, I would say one word about the IMF and uh, partnership with our um, country authorities and development partners. And finally, some uh, um, the way forward, what we think, at least in our work program, should be the focus in terms of uh, strategic themes. So in terms of the main takeaways, I would say that um, um, one way to characterize it is that the challenges of the Pacific Islands have changed over time, or better to say, the perception of these challenges have changed. In the past, it was just very well known within the region that the climate change was an issue, but every time, even myself, I was talking a few years ago with um, other um, authorities in other regional development partners, they were thinking that climate change was going to happen one day in 15 years, and then the world will, will, will stop. But um, this, thank God, have changed, and now it's it's a well known uh, it's a well known fact. But as was saying also during the panel, it's not about the challenges, but the region should also leverage uh, the opportunities. Uh, some of them were, were were raised. How to manage better the marine resources is one of them, and we should not reinvent the wheels. A lot of progress have already done. As an economist, I also want to show I want to stress that. Uh, um, the Pacific region um, is um, located in close to the most vibrant region in the world, um, and uh, therefore there are opportunities al also to, to leverage um, that, uh, that l the location. Um, the other aspect that was stressed was the importance of partnership and collaboration, and. Uh, I see this in, as two, uh, two pillars. One is to find regional solutions and way mm, to common problems that can benefit all parties. But the other one was also uh, stress and is how to find synergies and better collaborate. Uh, were, it was mentioning early on that um, every country has faced several ag agencies uh, talking about the same issue and providing s a different policy uh, response and therefore better coordination there. Uh, Perhaps the most important takeaway is that despite all the challenges that the Pacific Island face, um, policies matter. So it's not all about geography, it's not all about natural disasters, um, but the role of uh, um, the leaders in the region uh, is, is very important to tackle these challenges. Um, in terms of the regional solution to problems, in addition to the to, to what was said in terms of strengthening the capacity of bargaining power and extracting more, um, more rate of return on the marine resources. I also would like to stress uh, the importance of the seasonal employment scheme that was introduced by New Zealand in 2006 and also later on uh, followed by Australia. And um, um, the, the fact um, in, t in terms of policies, um, one other important issue is that mm, the Pacific Islands, through the face shocks, but they've also been resilient. They learn how to be resilient um, through through the through the 
different you know, natural disaster and climate change issues, um, they, w they actually f um, weather the financial crisis better than other, uh, other islands in, uh, in different regions like the Caribbean. And there is one of the reasons is that um, also thanks to the strong uh, partnership with the development partners that accumulated less debt uh, than other um, islands. I'm thinking, for example, about uh, the Caribbean islands. The uh, one word about the IMF is that the IMF is committed to tailor its, ass its assistance um, whether it's capacity building or is a policy advice to meet the unique challenges of the Pacific Islands. We will uh, be in Samoa uh, later this year, represented by the Deputy Managing Director of the IMF, uh, Mr. Uh, Min Ju, and uh, we hope to bring together the three regions, as, as uh, you were saying, in, a, in an event uh, to, sh to compare notes on uh, how to build the macro fiscal resilience in, in, the, in the island states. Um, in terms of partnership, of course, the IMF should leverage its comparative advantage, and it's in our comparative advantage is to look at macro fiscal stability, uh, make sure that the macroeconomic policy are sort of broadly adequate uh, to lift potential growth in the region, but we're also lately looking at competitiveness and how to uh, make sure that uh, these economies can continue to become, uh, to be uh, competitive in this globalized um, world. Um, one last issue which I think it's very important was touched base by Sylvia um, current um, is how to make growth more inclusive. This is a big issue uh, in the Pacific Islands, but not only in the Pacific Islands. There are several ways to do it. If countries are natural resources, of course, is about uh, putting in place the right tax system. But one way, and we've done also some work on that, is to make um, to increase women participation rate. Um, and we've seen that um, that also in other countries, this is proved to be you know one of the key ingredients for uh, raising growth. And um, the last uh, thing I would like to say is that, uh, as I said, um, some of these challenges the Pacific Islands face um, should, of course, be handled by country authorities, but. Uh, there are big externalities in climate change and natural disasters, so the international community, of course, uh, should, should continue to, uh, to discuss these issues because it's not enough to build fiscal space. These are huge costs that can, cannot be internalized by just by country authorities, and therefore we should all uh, be together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tumbrell, thank you very much. Uh, we are expecting another uh, a, a speaker, however, has been delayed. And so we've been asked to start to make our way outside to the, the patio here for a cultural performance. And we'll get the speech uh, from this other visitor soon after. Thank you. 